Shane Thompson of NPR Music says Sire introduced bands through underground college radio before turning to pop radio. When I was in college radio and I was kind of learning how to be a music nerd, there was such a stark line. Like, you could be underground and cool, or you could be mainstream and terrible. Sire Records and Seymour Stein found ways to kind of fuse those together. And that describes his greatest claim to fame when he signed an unknown who emerged from the underground dance scene in New York. Stein was in the hospital awaiting open-heart surgery when Madonna came to his bedside to demand a contract. He told that story to Terry Gross on Fresh Air. Here I was, you know, a mess. I probably hadn't taken a shower in a few days, and I freaked out. I had somebody come and shave me and cut my hair and look the best I could before she got there. She wanted a shot more than anything, and I wanted to give her that shot because I, I totally believed in her. Within a couple of years, the whole industry was trying to mimic all things Madonna. After learning of Seymour Stein's passing, Madonna posted, He was one of the most influential men in my life. He changed and shaped my world. Phil Harrell, NPR News. This is NPR News. Marketplace Morning Report is coming up next, and then in 10 minutes at 9 o'clock, it's the BBC News Hour on 93.9 FM. Let's check in with London to see what they're working on. London, good morning. Good morning, WNYC. I'm Razia Iqbal. On today's News Hour, history in the making, Donald Trump is due to appear in a New York court to face criminal charges. We'll be speaking to one of Mr. Trump's lawyers, and Finland is due to become the 31st member of the Defence Alliance NATO, a decision prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. BBC News Hour coming up at 9 on 93. 3.9 FM WNYC. Fifty-two with some sun out there this morning, mostly sunny and seventy-one for a high on this Tuesday. Tomorrow, chance of drizzle or light rain, patchy fog, cloudy as the temperature actually falls in the morning to late morning by all the way down to fifty-two degrees. Right now, fifty-two with some sunshine. We're heading up. To 71. It's 851. Thank you for tuning in this morning. WNYC supporters include Swan Galleries with African American Art at Auction Thursday, April 6th with works by Norman Lewis and Buford Delaney, Harlem Renaissance figure Augusta Savage, contemporary artist Betty Sarr and others. Info at swangalleries.com. The space race among billionaires and their companies is getting a little less crowded. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks delivers what's next in cybersecurity innovation to protect today's digital way of life. Learn more at paloaltonetworks.com. I'm David Brancaccio in New York. Virgin Orbit has filed for bankruptcy. The company owned by Richard Branson was trying to launch satellites in a cool way, but there's been a series of failures, including a doomed mission in January. Marketplace's Nova Safo is here with more. Yeah, Virgin Orbit says it's not able to raise enough new capital, David, to continue to operate after a failed rocket launch in January. It's still hoping that the technology it developed will find a buyer, though. And the premise for its technology is that it allows rockets carrying satellites to be launched from anywhere you can operate a major airliner. The company figured out how to use a modified Boeing 747 jumbo plane with a rocket launcher attached to it. So the plane can take off from pretty much anywhere there's a major airport, right? Fly high up and launch the rocket. The company says it successfully launched 33 satellites into orbit this way. Yeah, but it wasn't any match for the company's competition. Yeah, so Virgin Orbit uses relatively small rockets because, of course, they're connected to a plane. Elon Musk's SpaceX uses a much bigger delivery rocket, and it's reusable. And apparently that has been more attractive to customers. SpaceX has also sent astronauts into space already. It's reportedly currently valued at well over $130 billion. For Virgin Orbit, it's not even close. Right now it has a market value of about $65 million. But it's important to note, David, that... Virgin Orbit is only rockets and satellites. There's a separate Virgin Galactic, which is focused on taking people into space. 
they are still operating, and they currently have a market value of about a billion dollars. All right, Nova, thank you. Markets, Dow futures are up two-tenths of a percent, about 49 points. S&P and NASDAQ futures are up three-tenths of a percent. Crude oil up another eight-tenths percent today, just above $81 a barrel after OPEC's surprise cut in production to goose prices up Sunday night. The CEO of Disney has sharply criticized Governor Ron DeSantis, who's been pushing the entertainment conglomerate for objecting to the Florida law dubbed Don't Say Gay. DeSantis has been working with Florida legislators to limit Disney's special tax and land use status in the state where Disney, with its theme parks in Florida, employs 75,000 people. At a shareholder meeting yesterday, the Disney chief, Robert Iger, called the DeSantis moves, quote, anti-business and anti-Florida, saying Disney has a right to freedom of speech, just like individuals. A spokesman for the Florida governor says Disney continues to fight for special benefits and to dodge state law. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by JLL. Committed to providing adaptable floor plans with each real estate opportunity JLL offers that can benefit its clients' business, employees, and community. More at JLL.com. See a brighter way. Today is a grim anniversary of a terrible moment in U.S. history. Fifty-five years ago today, civil rights giant the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by an assassin at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. The nation and the world grieved. For the King family, the stresses and the trauma continued across generations. Now, experts study the health costs of stress in the context of racial inequity. Lee Hawkins is exploring the topic. He's a colleague who has a podcast in development for our APM Studios branch and is finishing his book, Nobody's Slave, How Uncovering My Family's History Set Me Free. Hey, Lee. Hey, how are you? Fifty-five years since the terrible events of Memphis, you've been reflecting on the stresses experienced by Dr. King's extended family, really even into new generations. Trauma preceded the assassination and new traumas followed for family members. It just goes on. Yes, and the fact that Dr. King's brother drowned uh, just a few years after his assassination, and then his mother was also assassinated while she was playing the organ at church in Ebenezer Baptist Church. And at the time, the kids, the King kids, were just children. And so to lose Dr. King, their uncle, and also their beloved grandmother really was something that put a lot of stress on the kids from a young age. Uh, and as a result of that, there were a lot of health implications. Yeah, I mean, you know, post-traumatic stress, the word stress is in there, but it's really trauma that is the most evocative word in that phrase. I think so. And as you're seeing, racism is now being deemed a public health crisis. The effects of accelerated aging are being studied in the context of racism by experts all over the country. And I thought that it was important to interview the King family about the impacts of that and the fact that so many people died early as a result of heart attacks. Dr. King's daughter, Yolanda, died at age 51. Uh, his brother, A.D., had five kids. Three of them died of heart attacks, including one that died at age 20. Um, when that happened, there were many other King family members who went in to get tested and they found out that many of them had heart complications. And now it could be genetic as well, because Dr. Martin Luther King, when they did the autopsy on him, it turned out that he had a heart of a 60 year old and he was only 39 years old. And so it raises serious questions about the impact of racism. And this research that's actually going on in this field, I think you did a podcast with experts pulled together by the famed Mayo Clinic. I think the overarching theme was racial health equity, but you heard biological evidence that trauma, post-traumatic stress, and other stresses can age people more quickly. Yes, indeed it can. In the scientific community, there's a real push to start to collect data about people's patient profiles and get ahead on uh, the possibility to prevent some of these illnesses. We do know that chronic stress from childhood, adverse childhood experiences, uh, having four or five or more of those can significantly increase the likelihood of a person dying 20 years earlier. 
So to be a young child and go through that, um, it wouldn't be surprising for someone to have a long-term effect and impact after all of that trauma. Lee Hawkins, thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Look for Lee Hawkins' new podcast from our APM Studios branch coming out in early 2024 about the intergenerational effects of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, along with the release of his book, Nobody's Slave, How Uncovering My Family's History Set Me Free. In New York, I'm David Brancaccio, Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media. Support for WNYC comes from Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Now on view, deconstructing power featuring innovative data visualizations that W.E.B. Du Bois created for the 1900 World's Fair. Tickets at cooperhewitt.org. Up next, the BBC News Hour on 93.9 FM and the takeaway on AMA 20. Today on the Brian Lair Show, how to address the problems that the BQE presents. Plus, the latest on New York's climate law and its fate in the state budget. That's coming up this morning at 10 on 93.9 FM. 52 and mostly sunny. Today, sunshine and 71 for a high. Tomorrow, drizzle chances and temp falling to the low 50s in the late morning. This is WNYC FM HD and AM New York. Welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service. I'm Razia Iqbal. Donald Trump is to appear in a court in New York, making him the first former US president to face criminal charges. We'll be outside the courthouse and hear a rebuttal that this is a political case. The idea that the district attorney of Manhattan is a political office is poppycock. The district attorney has a long history of bringing cases without fear or favor.